So what is chroma subsampling? Well, it reduces color information slash accuracy in favor of luminance information and accuracy. Because human eyes are more sensitive to light than color, chroma subsampling takes the original raw data from a video and drops chroma data, or the color, to preserve the luma data, or the brightness. Each level of subsampling, whether it's 420, 422, or 444, relates to how many chroma samples it keeps in a given theoretical area. In essence, the more chroma data that you keep, then the closer the encoded video will look compared to the original one. So you want to completely avoid as much subsampling as you can until you upload to YouTube, especially if you're going to be doing any color or VFX or temporal corrections. Why is this? Well, because when you modify any of the existing data in a chroma subsampled video, you aren't modifying what you perceive to be a perfect representation of that video, what your eyes see, you are really modifying a mathematical approximation. When you compress a video, the compressor basically looks at all of the data in that video and it makes decisions on where it can get away with not saving specific parts of a frame to save space on your hard drive. In doing so, it only stores some full frames, these full frames are called keyframes, that can be referenced, basically repeating the same data from frame to frame if it is unchanged, and interpolating how that data should change if it does. While great for streaming over the internet, obviously this is terrible when editing, because adding effects or changes based off of a mathematical approximation, which is what interpolation is, always results in visual anomalies, like macro blocks. Speaking of macro blocks, what are they? These are the blocks in videos that you see when playing back a heavily compressed video. Instead of having accurate frame-to-frame -frame information, the information is dropped and then approximated, sometimes grouping multiple theoretical areas together into larger ones. So what you see are visually lossy approximations and artifacts. While they're never good to see even in a video you want to watch, seeing them in a video you're trying to edit is even worse, because rather than changing the color values or applying visual effects to very specific pixels, macro blocking in edited footage applies those changes to large swaths of pixels because they're grouped together, which makes the issue worse. Bit depth is fairly easy to understand, actually. It refers to how many bits of information are used to represent the color of a single pixel. The more bits that are present, the wider the range of colors will be possible. So for instance, with 8-bit encoding, there are clear blocks present in the photo above. At 10-bit color depth, the gradient of the transition between colors becomes much smoother and more accurate, and overall I think it looks a lot better. A color gamut is the digital representation of the total physical spectrum of light in the real world. In other words, it encompasses every color and gradation of color that exists. There are multiple different color spaces found within the color gamut that target different ranges of it, for instance Rec. 709 and sRGB. RGB is the color format primarily used for any sort of content that is intended to be seen on a digital display. Pixels are given red, green, and blue color data and can replicate any number of colors from there. The vast majority of computer monitors, though not all, use this color format to display images. If you use an RGB monitor, you're going to want to record in RGB as well so that when you start color grading or altering anything, the recorded video will look as close to the original media as it possibly can, and you can then render out in the RGB format as well and serve it to YouTube. Rec. 709 is a specific color space in the color gamut that encompasses all of the color values that can be replicated within that color space. In other words, if the total number of television channels in the world were numbered 1 to 100, Rec. 709 would be something like HBO or any cable provider who only offered television channels from 1 to 50 but not the full range of channels from 1 to 100. 
Another cable provider could offer channels 30 to 70, but not the lower range of 1 to 30 and the upper range of 70 to 100. Because we're going to be viewing our videos on YouTube, in Rec. 709 we want to record our footage in Rec. 709 as well. OBS currently does not support Rec. 2020, although when they do, we'll be able to upload HDR content as Rec. 2020 captures a much larger color space than Rec. 709. YUV is an approximation of RGB. YUV is the color format that interprets the color gamut in a way that reduces the overall size of that file, but in a soft enough way as, so as to mask them from human perception. In other words, YUV describes a color space that allows for chroma subsampling. H.264 or H.265 are lossy codecs with great compression. Everyone knows what H.264 is. It's the most commonly used capture codec in existence at the consumer level because it allows for absolutely great compression, although in exchange for visual artifacting to some degree in the final video. UT Video records in RGB and is a mathematically lossless video codec, which means truer colors, color correction and VFX is possible, and temporal changes or predictions, like slow motion, are more accurate. In other words, because UT videos are barely compressed, if at all, any changes you make in the nonlinear editor are going to look far and away much better than the same changes made to the same video compressed in H.264. For professional productions that capture and record video at insane data rates, like Hollywood's RED camera at 6K 40fps RAW, their editors use a type of codec called an intermediary codec. While this doesn't really concern us, I believe it's useful to touch on it briefly and have a basic understanding of why they use one and how it can apply to hobbyists. An intermediary codec is a mathematically lossless codec that the raw original video is transcoded and compressed into. What this does is, it reduces the total bitrate, making timeline playback faster, while retaining your ability to color correct in an NLE. And when the project's done, it allows the footage to be interpreted back out to a delivery codec for the movie theater without any visually noticeable compression. In terms of playback speed on your timeline, there are two main variables at play, file compression and bitrate. Keep in mind that NVIDIA GPUs make real-time decoding of compressed files faster as well on the timeline. Now, without getting into the insane bit rates of billion dollar Hollywood productions, for the most part, a compressed file will be much slower to play back on your timeline than an uncompressed file. Why? Because for the uncompressed file, the only limiting factor is your hard drive's read speed. Whereas for playing back compressed videos, your CPU or GPU must uncompress every single frame in real time before serving it to your preview window in your NLE. For most use cases, editing a high bitrate H.264 file will stutter and struggle far more than editing UT video lossless files at the same resolution and the same frame rate. Because we've chosen the UT video encoder and the RGB color format, we are still able to make accurate color, VFX, and temporal corrections while also being smoother and faster to edit in whatever program you choose. In other words, we're sacrificing hard drive space for everything else. But more on the hardware requirements in a bit. For this, we're going to be using the DNxHR RGB 444 codec. Remember when I touched on the intermediary codecs that Hollywood and professional productions transcode into for editing? Well, ProRes and DNxHR are the two primary formats that they use, DNxHR RGB 444 10-bit being one of the codecs that you and I want to use as the final output. Why do I serve such a high quality video file to YouTube? It's kind of simple once you understand what YouTube does with the file once it's been uploaded. YouTube takes your file and uses it as a reference that is then stored forever on their servers. From this reference video, YouTube further compresses and transcodes it into various formats, one for each different resolution. 
So if we were to capture in H.264, render out our final video as H.264, and serve it to YouTube, the video that people would be watching would have been compressed a total of three times. Once when recorded, once when we rendered, and one final time by YouTube. This is called generational loss, and you want to avoid it at all costs. So, what does this all mean? Well, in trying to maximize visual quality as much as possible when streaming from YouTube, the least number of times that you compress, the better. Using this workflow, the only real lossy compression that occurs, occurs once at the very end on YouTube. That's it. And instead of a heavily compressed reference video that YouTube will use as a template with H.264, with the UT Video RGB 10-bit file, YouTube will instead be using the highest quality and most accurate colors possible to spin off each resolution of video on their site. Now here's the funny thing, because you're rendering out a high quality render without too much compression, rendering DNxHR videos is super fast, much faster than H.264 renders. In return though, YouTube takes upwards of 12 hours to process, sometimes 24. It's a little absurd, I know, but with proper planning and a little patience, I think the results really are worth it. So all that we've learned just now is useful and cool and all, but we need to actually apply this information in order to take advantage of what we've learned. Which finally brings us to hardware. With all of the numerous upsides that this workflow has over H.264 encoding, it does have one major downside. It takes up an awful lot of hard drive space. At 1440p 60 frames a second, I am recording at a whopping 400,000 kilobits per second, with 25 second videos being about 7 gigabytes in size. At 4K 60 frames a second, you can see bit rates of 1 gigabit per second uncompressed. What this means is that you need to dedicate a fast enough and large enough SSD to make this possible. The upside is that for most modern SSDs, these write speeds are very affordable, so this isn't that big of an issue. On the other hand, because read speed is now our bottleneck for how smooth the video plays back in our NLE, I have to strongly recommend that a small capacity M.2 SSD is dedicated to caching files within that program. The cache location must be located on a separate SSD from the files you are editing. The faster your dedicated cache disk is, the smoother playback will be. Fast Ethernet upload speeds for reducing the amount of time it takes to upload your final video to YouTube. Two computer monitors to help in the recording and editing process. I'll be going much further in depth about this in the next video. A dedicated SATA SSD for recording and an M.2 SSD for caching in your NLE. A 10-bit monitor for accurate color correction when editing. And finally, minimal time constraints. This workflow is targeted more towards the cinematic side of content creation. Being someone who doesn't upload a new video every week, and someone who has the opportunity to record in a very controlled environment, the massive file size is 100% manageable on my end. I can imagine though that if you're trying to record content for a montage, for example, this method of recording may not be feasible and is actually probably a little bit unnecessary. This video is not intended to try and persuade you to adopt this workflow, but rather to simply offer a glimpse into my side of things and to help you better understand the complexity of content creation. With that being said, I'm actually excited to see how many people this video manages to help. If you have any questions at all about any of the topics covered, please feel free to leave them in the comments and if I know the answer, I'll get to them as soon as I can.